So my name is Elizabeth Sayer. Um, I, it's 2017. I've been playing drums and percussion since 1990, more or less. So 20, 27 years. My main instrument are, are these drums, with the, which is the Afro-Cuban Mata drum, and I've played them since 1994. I wanted to tell you about my first trip to Cuba, which was on Y2K. Everyone thought planes were going to fall out of the sky and major infrastructures were going to stop working because of the turnover of the numbers or something. You know what I mean? So on Y2K, I flew to Cuba. The first leg of my flight was from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh and there were only four people on the plane. I think because it was Y2K and it was 6 a.m. So I rode in first class for the first time in my life. I think I've only ever ridden first class twice, but that was the first time. So, so anyway, I, I went to Cuba and I, I ended up connecting with Amelia and staying at her house in January 2000. This was five months before she ended up passing away. I took song class with her. I connected with her uncle, who's also her cousin. His, his name is Lázaro Pedroso. Um, and he's also a master singer and a drummer in, in Havana. And um, anyway, so during the time I was there with Amelia, her group, had a couple of performances and she invited me to play with her group. So I was very excited to play Bata with an all-female Cuban group in Havana. We one, one gig they had was at the National Union of Artists and Writers, UNEAC, which has like, they have like a Sunday peña where different groups perform, so we played there. On January 13th, which was toward the end of my trip, we were the group was invited to play at the anniversary of someone's initiation, which is called a cumpleaños de santo or a cumpleaños de ocha. And it's a remembrance of the time when the person was initiated to a particular spirit. So we went to this gentleman's apartment in Old Havana. He was an Oshun, he had been initiated to Oshun, the, the river daddy, 15 years before, something like that. And her drum, Amelia's group had been invited to play um, uh, in this, in somebody's home, private, a private celebration, and they invited me to play with them. One of their musicians wasn't available, so I was like, "Oh man, this is really exciting." So, um, we we got there and we played directly to the sh the sh the first thing that you do in a, an occasion like that or any any ceremony involving the bata drums is you play for directly to the spirits. You, you and it's an instrumental long instrumental sequence called the Oro Seco or the Oro del Igbodu, which mean, basically means prayers in the room, prayers in the shrine room. So you play these drummed prayers. So there I was with Amelia Pedroso um, and another woman named Aleda um, Socarras Torres, whose, whose father and brother are famous bata players from Havana. So I was there with Alina and Amelia, and I played along with them. And um, this this occasion blew my mind that we were playing directly to a shrine because I had been told in the U.S. you will never play, no one will ever teach you. Why are you doing this? There I was with Alina and Amelia, who were very well respected cultural insiders, um, who had knowledge of this musical and spiritual tradition from their family lineage and I was playing with them in the setting and I'd always been told oh you can't you know you shouldn't do that or why are you know I, I had questioned myself as well because it was um, in a way it was kind of like there wasn't any um, apprenticeship or learning environment that I could easily step into um, not to say that it's not challenging for men as well, because men have to find, they have to find a good teacher. They have to compete. There's a lot of competition. Um, they have to learn, you know, learning is not trivial. They have to learn to play well. Um, but nonetheless, I've been told that you'll never do that. You'll never play in a, you, nobody will ever let you play in a religious setting. And there I was playing with these two amazing Cuban women on my first trip in the year 2000 felt very millennial you know like 
wow, okay, so I was right not to believe what people told me. It, it was kind of felt very confirm, conf, affirming of my sort of headstrong and perhaps a little egotistical decision to just go ahead and do this, even though, you know, it was maybe offensive to some of my mentors, early mentors in, in music. In one way, I feel really lucky that early on in my drum training in Philadelphia, I started playing for dance classes and was, all, was always around dancers who were dancing to drumming. So I feel like I was lucky to have that be part of my early formation because in the, so in the mid nineties, after I've been playing for a while and then in the late nineties, I started to connect with dancers and play for dancers, play Afro-Cuban music for dancers, bata, drumming with dance. And there, there are very, like I was telling you that a, the singer has to be very technically knowledgeable and the drummers do as well. Well, there's also a very technical connection to dance. Certain dance steps go with certain rhythms. There are certain sequences that you follow, thing, things like that. So in, in 99, 1999 in New York, um, I had a connection. I had, I had the opportunity along with some other women I was playing with at that time in New York to start playing for a Cuban dancer named Pupi Insua, Felix Insua Pupi. He was, he was um, infamous. He's also now passed away. And he was uh, just a very flamboyant personality. He, his, his uh, guardian spirit, his guardian angel, his orisha was Shango, and he really personified um, Shango in a lot of ways. Very uh, flirtatious, very, very masculine, very confident. Just um, he had a lot of feeling and a lot of flavor in in the way he danced. Anyway, he was looking for drummers for his dance class and in the spring of 99 and a friend of ours heard about it and kind of brokered this connection with him. I think some of my friends knew him already, but they were kind of like, these girls are, are playing bata and playing congas. They could, they could play for your class. And so he was like, okay. And he, the, on the first day he, he told, he told us I'm more, cause nobody, no woman had ever really played bata in a dance class in a public setting in New York before this in 1999. Um, there, were, there were some women playing bata and studying bata in New York in the, earlier than that, but um, nobody had ever, playing a dance class kind of gives you a regular, steady public footing, I'd say. So no one had ever done that. And so he said to us, well, I'm more scared than you are the first day. I don't think he was really scared, but he was certainly would have been open to criticism. So that was a big, that was a big moment and sort of set me and these and the other women I was playing with on this on this path of we played with him for a couple of years and then we played for another Cuban dancer named Yamile Malagón Vega who she she had previously danced in the uh, Conjunto Folklorico Nacional de Cuba which is a very prestigious national folklore group she danced with them we played for her um, we played for American dancers and then we also played for um, Danis Perez La Mora, who's a, who's a well-known choreographer and dancer from Santiago de Cuba. So we played for a whole sequence of Cuban dancers in New York. Really, really, I did that for about, um, in New York, I did that for about 10 years, um, from 99 to 2009. And then, um, after that, I wasn't able to go to New York as frequently anymore for a couple of years. And I play, I started playing Afro-Cuban classes in Philadelphia for dancer, for one dancer there in particular. And, and it was, um, you know, by that time I had developed enough proficiency on the drum to where I was a peer with the, with the other drummers who were playing in the class in, in Philadelphia. So, so anyway, so that, that whole inch, and then I moved to the Bay area. And since I moved here in 2012, I've been playing with Susana Arenas Pedroso, accompanying her dance classes and playing with her company. And, and I had, I met Susanna many years ago in Philadelphia when she came over there to work. We performed together over there. And she's, she's, a, she's an excellent folkloric artist, very demanding, um, uh, very high artistic quality, I'd say. Uh, and it's, it, to, me, to me, it's great. And, it, and drumming, you know, drumming for drumming's sake with other drummers, with other musicians is beautiful, but also 
this music is intended, this drum, particular drum music and other styles of, of course, are intended to go with dance. So it's just, a, it kind of feels like a completion to work with dancers, to learn how to complement dance. I wanted to just address sort of race, culture, gender, identity from my perspective, having having started as a more generalist percussionist, like I had played congas and I played Brazilian percussion, shake ray, and then I kind of discovered the bata and that's become a specialty for me. I still play the other things, but this has really been something that I've dug into. So, um, you know, I'm an, I'm an Anglo-American from Delaware, um, middle class upbringing. Um, how, how could it be that I do this or that, that might be, that's been a question for me or, or um, also, you know, I've had, I have had a relatively privileged position in this, in this musical style, the ability to travel to Cuba and study, the ability to go to New York on a frequent basis for years to play and study. So um, I would say that the same, you know, the same racial and cultural dynamics that are at play in our wider society also play out in, in drum communities. You know, there are debates. The Bay Area is really rich for women drummers. There are a lot of women drummers playing here, and that's true. It's also very rich in Afro-Cuban. It's, it's, it's an area that's known nationally for Afro-Cuban dancers and great drummers on the bata drums and congas, ma ma male players. And they're, they're different. In a way, it's kind of factionalized, or you know, there are different communities. There, there are um, African American artists who don't really, you know, who don't feel comfortable with all the white artists who are in the in the field, and and I respect that. I I believe like there's, um, I understand why uh, people who maybe have a lot of privilege or who don't show an awareness of um, understanding all the suffering that produced a certain cultural tradition could, you know, it could be offensive or you might want to be in your own space. I understand as a, also as a woman drummer, I understand why women drummers want to be in their own space because there, are, it ha, you know, it has been a struggle to connect to, um, connect to teachers who really want to see you grow and be on a, on an equal footing with or be as good as you could be, let's say, in your within your art form. Afro-Cuban music and dance are practiced internationally by um, great Cuban artists who've left Cuba and by other artists who've learned from them. So it's at, at this point, I feel like it's an international art form. And, and I feel fortunate because I've always been encouraged, like, I feel like great Cuban artists and teachers have encouraged me to, to don't stop playing. You play really well. Keep going. Um, don't give up. You know, do you know th that kind of um, encouragement? I've been lucky. So it's not traditional to play by myself. But here, here's a little bit of the sound of these of the bata drums, I guess.